Okay, je suis Hello and welcome to the first session of 2024. Um, this is slightly out of sequence. It's a uh, part of our um, doctoral consortium series from last semester. Um, our final session um, had to be canceled at the last minute, but we're, I'm delighted to have a follow-up session um, uh, to complete the series um, on the theme of AI apocalypse. The series was called The Dark Side of AI, and all the previous sessions are <clears throat> me, uploaded onto our uh, Digital uh, Futures dot International um, uh, uh, YouTube channel, um, and I would say that from that the, the first five in the series um, that we became a bit more, I guess, lenient in some way. I, I started off by saying, well, actually, we do need to worry about AI, and and over this course of the series, which is actually fascinating because we had a series on questions such as copyright and so on and so on, I think people softened up a bit and said, no, we don't have to worry about AI. Today, I, I'm really delighted um, to, to have Eric Kessel here with us. Eric is um, uh, a designer, educator, writer, and post-disaster expert, Professor Disaster, I guess. Um, and uh, Eric um, takes a, a rather more kind of um, uh, 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 concerned um, attitude towards AI. He's He was formerly the director of the Sustainable Environment Design major at the College of Environmental Design um, at, CU, at, uh, um, at uh, uh, UC Berkeley. He's currently a special program instructor at Harvard Extension School. Um, and Eric really has made a name for himself as um, using the kind of lens, shall we say, <clears throat> of disaster theory, disaster studies, to look at things. He recently published what I think was a um, uh, an extraordinary article um, uh, in Design Intelligence um, uh, looking at the at the question of what the impact of AI would be on the profession. Um, today then Eric is going to make a presentation. Um, we are going to have, I will have a, a short discussion with him and then we'll open up to questions from um, not only on the Zoom audience itself but also from, from YouTube. So um, uh, feel free to uh, put in some of these questions. Um, probably not as long a session as, as, as sometimes some of our sessions, but uh, this is, I think, going to pick up as we go because I think this is an absolutely fascinating topic. So, Eric, um, welcome. Um, uh, it's great to see you. Um, and uh, it's a great way to kick off the new year with a bang, shall we say. Um, AI apocalypse. <laughs> um... Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the chance to to talk about it. Um, I've actually um, entitled my lecture AI Apocalypse? Question mark. I, th I think it still remains to be seen, and we have some agency in in what happens in the future of design, uh, architecture, and AI. Um, but um, first, uh, let's let's break this down. We're going to go through an introduction. Um, talking about crisis and disaster, um, how to cultivate a disaster lens, um, what that looks like, um, then deconstruct some myths on, on AI and architecture, um, and then finally wrap it up with the brighter side of disaster, because there is one, um, and I'm fundamentally an optimist, so um, I hope everybody sticks around for that. Um, so, uh, a bit about me. Um, I've done a lot of things in my career. Um, I've had a pretty eclectic experience. Um, been an activist, uh, humanitarian builder, um, periodically an architect, a construction manager, brief interlude for graduate school, um, a disaster responder, a kind of design Cassandra, you might call it, um, a writer, radio host, professor, and academic director. Um, and that brings us into 23-24, um, which was an interesting year for me because a lot of these things effectively came together um, to launch this this recent mission around AI and, and architecture and the potential consequences for it. Um, my work has, has been all over the place, but I think I'm probably principally known for two things. Um, one, writing a book called Down Detour Road um, in 2010 at the height of the Great Recession, and that was inspired by a different kind of crisis. Uh, I read an article in The Nation, I believe it was, or maybe it was The Guardian, that talked about the relative unemployment rates for different professions. And I was shocked slash not shocked to find out um, that architects were at the bottom of the list out of you know 700 something professions or 380 professions, I'm sorry. 
um, but they were facing sevenfold, eightfold increase in, in unemployment claims. And, you know, this didn't make a ton of sense to me. Um, and my read on it was that the profession was in crisis. I mean, it was a recession, so everybody was in crisis, but architecture was in its own particular crisis. And to me, it was a crisis about value. Um, people had ceased to really value architecture was what explained that for me. Um, I wrote a book about it uh, called Down to a Road, um, which the premise of was that, you know, people had ceased to see the value in architecture because I think architecture had ceased to see the value in people. During the deconstructivist period, we got into a lot of formalism and distance ourselves from the problems that people deal with in their everyday life. And, um, you know, that led to a lot of openings and, and hopefully an optimistic message about architecture. Secondly, I'm probably best known for, for my post-disaster work, um, which began while I was still a student. Um, this is a picture taken of me right before I went down for my first assignment in Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, where I was working with the Biloxi Gulf Coast uh, Community Design Studio under David Perks. Um, and it was an education. I think it put me in touch with the real power of, of architecture. From there, I went to Haiti with Architecture of Humanity, um, and that was a furtherance of my design education and understanding about what, um, what the real power of, of architecture can be um, when it's pointed in the right direction. And I was blessed to be surrounded by an incredible team from all over the world. Uh, it was about a third Haitian, about a third Haitian diaspora, and about a third international, which in itself it's composed of architects from 10 countries. Um, and we put together a pretty incredible program of community-based design, working with survivors of the earthquake in 2010 to rebuild schools, clinics, whole communities at times to offer training. Um, this has been the bulk of my practice actually, um, is helping people through disaster and helping them imagine better, futures, um, because there's always the potential for a better future after disaster. So um, from there, I went to Japan um, and assisted with that program under a similar remit. Um, subsequently, New York, the Philippines, um, kind of all over. And that work was enough to earn me a, a kind of dubious moniker of, you know, being architecture's first responder, um, or so-called by the Daily Beast. Um, I retired from field work uh, in 2015 after the Nepal earthquake and turned my attention to teaching first at WashU and then subsequently at Berkeley and most recently at Harvard. And in those programs, in varying ways, I teach about disaster and resilience. I try and bring those lessons and those conversations forward um, into you know, the practice of architecture and the teaching of the practice of architecture and design, um, among other things. And through that work, um, I developed, uh, I guess you could call it a theory of disaster um, and how to look for it, how to understand it, how to see the world through that particular lens. Um, and all of this came together last year when I was asked to write an article for Design Intelligence Quarterly, the article that, that Neil mentioned in the introduction. And it wasn't originally supposed to be on AI, um, but between myself and, and the editor there, um, we agreed that it would be. And that launched um, an exploration. Um, and it was fueled by a skepticism, I think. Um, at the time, this would have been February of 2023, um, there was a disconnect between what was happening in the world and what was happening in design. I mean, I suppose there typically is, but um, this one seemed a bit more ominous. Um, in the world, we were hearing messages about, you know, AI is going to destabilize everything and the World Bank and the IMF were predicting huge job losses and massive change. Um, professors at Wharton and top business schools and economists were, you know, looking at this as a very, very serious development in the future of work. And then there was, you know, the design world. Um, so, you know, I read the same design rags as everybody else, I suppose. Um, so, you know, we kept hearing messages from design leaders to this effect. Um, you know, there, there, there's nothing that can compete with architects. Um, this one from Shane Berger, um, you know, the, the, the design process is going to remain, remain fundamentally human. There's this kind of limited capabilities. Um, and I wanted to understand for myself um, where the truth lay. I suspected it lay somewhere between those 
to polarities. Um, and, you know, I asked if I could explore this through this article for design intelligence and they, they gratefully said yes. Um, so, you know, I sat down to figure out, you know, what, what exactly I thought the impact was going to be. And the prevailing line at that time was that, you know, AI is going to automate the simple things. Um, it's not going to automate the more complex work. So for me, the greater challenge was, you know, how do you um, envision or propose that AI might actually, um, you know, replicate some of that higher level work that, that architects and designers do. Um, and I borrowed something from Phil Bernstein's book, Machine Learning, a framework for understanding the relative cognitive complexity of different tasks that exist within an architect's day. If you've read that book, if you haven't read that book, you should, uh, it's a great book. Um, but Phil has this um, framework essentially for ordering projects between, you know, procedural, like really kind of task, uh, rope, repetitive tasks sort of things um, up to integrative and perceptive. Those are the higher level cognitive functions. Um, and he provides us with a brilliant map essentially for where all these things occur within the architectural process. And just to make my life difficult, um, I said, well, you know, what if we aspire to get it to replicate the harder parts rather than the easier parts? I figured the easier parts would figure itself out. And to me, and I think to um, Phil as well, um, you know, the hardest parts are the integrative stuff, right? It's the vision. It's being able to sit with a client and a context and understand through typically inarticulate words, what that vision is actually going to be and to bear it out in the form of an idea for, for a building or something like that. And as a proof of concept that, you know, I initially made for myself just to, to make sure I knew what I was talking about, I developed um, a video, which I think um, Neil also mentioned in, in the beginning, but it's attached to the article. You can find it on my YouTube channel or you can find it on design intelligence. Um, but I'm gonna play a short, clip um, just to introduce what I'm talking about here. Hilda told me a bit about your project and I'm excited to learn more. Can you share your vision for it? I'm looking to build a modern, sustainable home for myself and my two children. I want the design to have clean lines and be environmentally friendly. It's important for me to... So what you're looking at, and this goes on for about 20 minutes, is two GPTs set in opposition to each other. And they've both been programmed with personalities. So I said to the model, like you are the client, you are a successful tech executive, um, you are a mother of two, you have a passion about kayaking, you know, this sort of thing. But I didn't give her any specific information necessarily about the architectural process or anything like that. And I did the same thing with the gentleman on the left who was the architect, right? Um, he was an architect, he was 55, <clears throat> you know, he went to school at Columbia. Um, this, that, and the other thing, but I didn't give him any instructions on, on what being an architect actually meant. Um, and Hilda you know, told me a bit about you. Let's fast forward through that. Uh, through that conversation, um, GPT was able to generate a design brief um, based on the interview that the client had had. Truthfully, it was just GPT having a conversation with itself, but nonetheless, Based on that exchange, which was totally autonomous, it generated a design brief, which was then able to convert to image prompts, which went into Midjourney. Once Midjourney 5 debuted, I was able to actually get image recognition to play along. So Carla, the client, could actually look at the design options and respond. Um, that was a little disarming. The really alarming part were all of the emerging um, phenomena that came out of this. Um, I guess emerging capabilities is, is what the AI world calls them. But um, ChatGPT illustrated some, some alarming knowledge about the process itself. So, you know, once it had gone through this design process, I asked it to produce a door and room schedule, uh, which it did. Um, and, you know, oddly somehow knew that like bathrooms should have one window and not two um, and that a powder room might be, the exception powder room might have zero windows um, as opposed to one. So, you know, the, it was picking up on all these lot of things that that might be known to an architect or might even be known to a lay person. Um, but I certainly did not expect that the model would be able to extrapolate all that information just from a 20 minute conversation between an artificial architect and, and an artificial client. It did the same thing with budget. Um, 
they came up with a budget for 2.2 million. Um, again, no, no extraneous information. I mean, it inferred that from the site and from whatever Carla, the client was saying to this architect that, that she wanted out of her house. Um, checked with a few contractor friends and like a lot of this AI stuff, you know, wasn't wrong. Um, could have been better, but it was, it was in the ballpark. Um, so this immediately struck me as a disaster. Um, because disasters typically happen when the perceived threat is much different than the actual threat. That's what gets us into trouble as a, as a species. So in my estimation, um, you know, I didn't believe the doomsayers. Um, they were saying that, you know, this is the end times. Um, but I didn't believe the Pollyanna stuff that I felt was coming out of a lot of the design professions. Um, the truth was somewhere in the middle um, and didn't look great. Um, but let me flesh out what I mean by a disaster lens to shed some light on that. Um, so how do we cultivate a disaster lens? I always teach my students that there are things that you can look at that speak to um, the growing vulnerability and um, precarity of a particular context or situation, right? So if you're looking at a disaster, like a natural disaster, like an earthquake, fire, hurricane, that sort of thing, you might look towards, you know, neglected infrastructure, trending towards decay, you know, bridges and power stations that should have been replaced a long time ago. Um, you might also look to the emergence of patchwork solutions. So if instead of replacing the broken levee, we just keep building it two feet higher over and over, that's usually a pretty good clue. Um, a widening or deepening of the zone of vulnerability. So 100,000 people living in a fault line, that could be a problem. Um, that can be a disaster. That city swells to 3 million people. Um, then you've got a really serious disaster on your hand. Same fault line, just different zone of vulnerability. Um, widespread irrational incredulity. Um, this is a tough one to pin down, but basically it's it's the anti-chicken little phenomenon. Um, the people who believe it can't happen here. And that is an emotional and a psychological belief that isn't particularly grounded in any evidence or analysis. It's just the way that, that people feel about things. Um, all of these things taken in their sum, or even one by one, um, don't necessarily constitute a disaster. This is merely the, the framework, the things that um, set up the possibility of disaster. Um, I liken it to a tornado watch and a tornado warning. Um, and then I find that people don't really understand what that is, especially if you're outside the United States. Um, so I've actually happened upon like the taco watch and the taco warning is the way to explain that. So taco watch is like you have all the ingredients for a taco, but there's no taco. It's just a bunch of ingredients laying around. Taco warning is like, we have a taco, like we're having tacos right now. You need to react to that sort of situation. So the four things, and that's not a comprehensive or exhaustive list. Um, you know, we go through much more through the course of a semester, but, you know, there's things that you can look at um, that essentially create the possibility of tacos, um, so to speak. Um, finally, you need a triggering event. Um, that's the thing that ultimately brings a disaster into the news, into reality. And believe it or not, I've always found the best way to explain this is by using beavers as an analogy. So when a beaver goes to cut down a tree, um, it doesn't cut down the entire tree and it doesn't push the tree over. It's not a very strong animal. You're talking about, you know, 30 or 40 pound animal versus, you know, a 10,000 pound tree. What it does do is it eats around the base and steadily erodes the structural integrity of the tree. And eventually a gust of wind comes along and it blows the tree over. Um, that is not the beaver's doing. Um, it's the wind that blew over the tree. The beaver just set up the conditions for the wind to be able to do that. Um, and we can map this over time um, and look at, you know, essentially a wind condition, right? Then the wind's blowing however the wind's blowing. Um, and then a rate of chewing that is constant, um, presumably. Um, and then because the rate of chewing is constant, the structural integrity of the tree is steadily declining. Um, disasters happen here in the red circle. Um, at that intersection of some event and some trajectory of vulnerability, that's where the disaster in fact occurs. It does not occur when the wind is strongest. It does not occur at some particular point of vulnerability. 
you really have to bring those two things together in time um, in order to, you know, have a disaster. Um, you can apply the same logic to a city. And in fact, in my classes, we often do. Um, you can take the healthy growth of a city, you know, maybe at, at 2% or something like that. Um, but the population density is growing faster than that, which suggests a lack of housing or something else going on. Um, the average wealth of population is going down, which means people have fewer resources to support themselves in the event of a disaster. Um, the budget for emergency services is static, even though the population and the population density is increasing. Um, the average age of critical infrastructure, so, you know, bridges and buildings and, and everything is, is falling apart. You could roll this stuff up together, not necessarily in an arithmetically way, um, but you can roll this stuff up into some kind of picture of overall resilience, right? Based on the number of things that are going up and the number of things that are going down and how impactful those things are, you get a sense of whether the resilience, the ability to resist an event um, is going up or down for a particular city in this case. And then you have, you know, the event itself, like the earthquake um, that happens every 100 years, or 200 years, 500 years, whatever it is. Um, but when it does, as it crosses that intersection, that's what creates a disaster. I mentioned the 2010 Haiti earthquake uh, previously. Haiti had actually had a similar sized earthquake um, 200 years prior. Um, of course, nobody remembered because we don't remember things that happened 200 years ago. Um, not a big disaster, not a lot of damage because there was hardly anyone there. It was 200 years ago. So Port-au-Prince was there. It was just a very, very small city and most of the buildings were made of wood. So you really have to look at the possibility of disaster as something that is happening through time. Um, so we can actually translate this disaster lens, this disaster thinking to non-physical things. And that also happens in my classes from time to time. Um, we can apply it to non-physical things um, like a profession itself, um, which is kind of how I started looking at all of this stuff. So in terms of infrastructure, well, professional architecture is terrible infrastructure. You know, we have long licensing periods, low pay, precarious employment, cutthroat competition. Um, it's not a structurally sound profession necessarily. Um, we can we can debate that, but um, yeah. At any rate, um, and then we have, you know, patchwork solutions. So, you know, if the profession is facing a crisis of value, then it keeps kind of doing these, these stepwise things like, you know, slightly changing the, the internship program uh, that, that everybody has always disliked under any particular form um, or, you know, transitioning to BIM, but not capturing the value off of that transition. Um, a widening zone of vulnerability. Well, you know, there's 17% more architects than were a decade ago, but AI is going to leave them with less work to do. Um, how much less work? We're not really sure, but um, that that pool of vulnerability is is getting larger. Um, and then the widespread irrational incredulity. Um, and I would put in this box um, specifically, you know, design voices that are saying, well, there's not going to be any impact on architecture. There's just going to be impact everywhere else. I mean, that ignores all fundamental laws of economics. I mean, if there's huge job losses in the non-architecture world, in the rest of the economy, um, that has macroeconomic effects, right? So probably gets us to 5%, 10% employment, um, causes a recession. The last time that there was a recession with 10% unemployment in this country, a third of all architects lost their jobs. So the idea that you know, AI might have some huge effect uh, on other professions, but not on architecture is, is incoherent, um, in my opinion. Um, and the triggering event, right? What is the triggering event in this case? Um, you know, in 2008, it was the Great Recession. Um, and I think that the debut of natural language generative AI may, in this case, be the triggering event. So we can map this out the same way that we have with these other things and say, you know, look, for the profession of architecture, the complexity of buildings is increasing. That's good for architects because it means they have more to do. Um, the cost of construction um, is increasing. Um, that's also good because design fees usually track with construction costs. Student loan balance is going up. That's not good because it means architects themselves, especially the younger ones, are in more precarious individual situations. 
Um, pay relative to inflation is going down. Okay, that's not so good. Um, so the overall resilience is is going downwards. And then similar like what we saw with the tree and, and subsequently with the city, um, we have this curve, you know, whatever it is, the, sh the shock to the system, be it a recession or a new technology or, or something like that, um, that brings about the disaster, right? The disaster happens at some point in the future. Um, so why doesn't this feel like a disaster? Um, I can hear some of you saying, um, and we don't think of it in a disaster the way we do an earthquake or a hurricane or something like that. Um, and I think that the, the hesitancy to understand it as such is translatable from you know physical hazards to professional hazards and et cetera. We protect ourselves from the psychological toll of impending disaster through myths, right? We invent ideas about what's going to happen and what's not going to happen in order to protect ourselves from the really high emotional and psychological costs of understanding that. Um, that's the logic of it can't happen here. It can't happen to me. Um, human beings are actually not very good at judging the future. Um, so we create these myths about what's going to happen in the future, um, and they keep us safe. When we tell ourselves it can't happen here, um, that's a problem, because if we really believe that, we're not preparing for it. Um, and I think that was part of the point of Sinclair New Lewis's novel, is that if you think it can happen here, you'll take steps to prepare for it. But if you've washed out the possibility in your own mind, then... Um, you know, it kind of opens the door to whatever's coming next. Not a guarantee, but it opens that door. Um, so how do we deconstruct these myths? Um, this is my favorite part. Um, and on my sub stack, life is a disaster. Um, you'll find lots of examples of this where I kind of go and break down, you know, myths associated with, with AI and, and architecture. But let's deal with um, five of them just for today real quick. Um, myth one, um, AI won't replace jobs, not tasks. Um, I started with this one because it's patently absurd. Um, that's what a job is. Like, it's just a bunch of tasks that roll up into some project and um, projects that roll up into programs and programs that roll up into practices. Um, so what we're told, um, what we've been being told about this AI stuff is that, you know, you're going to have a firm and then... Um, everybody is going to, you know, essentially have more time because, you know, all of this technology is going to automate away all of the, the boring tasks that we have. Um, this isn't how it plays out. And, you know, if anybody's ever been in a firm where layoffs were going on, this isn't what happens. You know, they don't allow people to just have their workload reduced necessarily. Every firm principle in the world is obsessed with utilization. Like, how do we get people to a maximum level of utilization so that you know we're billing the clients for for that person's time? So, the more likely scenario is actually this one, right? Um, workload is reduced through technological efficiencies, and you just don't need that fifth person anymore. Um, that is what happens um, in the face of technological evolution and efficiency gains. Um, and then, you know, at the end, you have four architects instead of five, and they're fully utilized because that work has been redistributed. Um, this has to be the case um, because of the way that we define work. Um, so work is just some amount of effort times some amount of time. Um, that's all it is. And in the example on screen, two full-time equivalents for six months is equivalent to um, about 2,000 hours a month, uh, a year, rather. That's the same as one person working full-time for a year. Um, it's also the same as um, three people working for four months. That's all the same amount of work. Now, any technological evolution is going to have one of two effects. It's either going to give us less work to do, meaning like it reduces the overall amount of labor involved in a task, or it's going to speed things up, meaning we can get things done faster, or it's going to do both. Um, and both of these are problematic for architecture. So under scenario one, where it just reduces the overall work, we've got a problem because there's just not as much work to do. Um, technology has taken something that used to take a week and now it takes an hour. Um, so we got to find something for that person to do with the rest of their week. Um, scenario two, things moving faster um, can also be uh, problematic, almost certainly will be. 
because as you start to speed things up, you end up with these holes in the project cycle. Um, so, you know, what do you do with that time? Um, the most likely scenario, in my opinion, is that it's actually both, um, that it speeds things up, but also reduces the overall amount of labor involved. So, um, yeah, we got problems. Um, this is potentially disastrous. Um, myth number two, um, AI will automate the tasks we don't like, uh, leaving us more time to design. Um, I've heard this everywhere uh, in, in kind of every article and, and uh, position point on AI. There's somehow this belief that, you know, once AI automates away all the shop drawings and, you know, uh, red line and CAD drawings and, and you know, all this shit, um, we can just spend all of our time designing. And it's a very attractive idea um, because we love design. That's what we were trained for and that's what we went to school for. Um, I like designing, um, but I don't think that this is possible because it's actually constructed on top of several other myths. Um, if this is the idea that we're going to have, you know, huge amounts of time to spend in design now that construction documents and all the rest have been sped up, um, I think the problem there is we don't necessarily choose where technology is going to have an impact. So the presumption behind that idea of, you know, having more and more design time is that, you know, AI is going to have a huge impact here on the stuff that we don't like to do, and then none here. Um, and technology does never really work that way. You know, once a technology like cell phones or electricity or computers penetrates, um, it becomes a de facto expectation. So if you're a photographer and you don't want to use Photoshop, you don't have to. It's not like the law. Um, but you're going to have a real problem coexisting in a competitive economy with photographers that do. So we don't necessarily just get to decide, you know, where technology applies, generally speaking. Um, I think there's also something about the law of diminishing returns. Um, and I think mature designers get to a point where they realize that designs get to a point where they're, you know, 95, 96% of perfect. And we have that drive within us to get them to 100%. And we know that we can, but the closer you are to design perfection, if such a thing exists, um, the harder it is to resolve those last little bits without going back and reinventing everything that that you just did. I think clients also understand this, which is you know why they put a deadline on you. Professors understand it. That's why you have final review, because if those deadlines didn't exist, we would just keep working forever. So if you imagine this graphically, you say, okay, you know, there's um, a design that it's 95% perfect and I'm going to work asymptotically to get it towards that, you know, final product. Um, this has financial implications for whoever's paying the bill for your design time. At first, it's a loss because the design adaptations, whatever it is, have not been fully resolved. You need time to think through that and to think through, okay, how do I get from 95% to 100% perfect design, idealized design in everybody's mind? Um, so someone is taking a loss on that particular time. As those choices start to mature, assuming that you were a brilliant designer, which I'm sure you are, um, the payout becomes really high, like the marginal payout for every additional unit, uh, day, week, month of design time climbs rapidly because you know, you're know resolving the things that weren't resolved in the 95% scenario. But the closer you get um, to perfection, the more those uh, uh, gains start to diminish. That's in the nature of diminishing returns of asymptotic growth and, and all these other things. So that's why it seems like for a lot of clients, like 95% is good enough, right? They're not interested in paying for you to, you know, get to 100%. Exceptions exist, obviously. Um, but, you know, for a lot of clients, you know, good enough is, is good enough. Um, because, you know, fundamentally, when we're working like this, like different kinds of changes have different value through time. So... I think the most convincing micro myth under this myth is what I'd call the creativity surplus. Um, and I'm sure everybody has seen some version of this cartoon at some point. Um, you know, the architect starts out with some brilliant vision, um, hugely aspirational about what to do with the design. Uh, 
gets a little knocked down with the meeting with the client. And then like, you know, you go through all the working drawings and budget revisions and value engineering. And, you know, pretty soon, like the building is, is kind of ordinary, right? Um, so I think from a standpoint of, of value analysis, um, if we can't get clients to pay us for all the creativity that we have now, um, why would we suspect that they're going to pay us for more of it? Um, so, you know, this idea that this technological advance will, will lead to this explosion in design activity and design time, um, unless you're working for yourself, I don't see it being true. Like someone is still going to have to pay you for all of that, that time. Um, so myth number three, um, AI won't place architects because architects are too smart um, or creative or charming, uh, attractive, um, you know, take your pick. Um, I've seen lots of ideas like this. Um, I think that's that's probably true. And I think it's it's a red herring argument that people are making sometimes where they say, you know, AI will not get to the level of human. The reality that we need to understand is that AI does not need to get to human level in order to displace humans, because that's not how people make purchasing decisions. Um, everybody has had, you know, some cheapo client at some point, um, and everybody has had like a dream client at some point. And we can borrow a concept from economics um, called an indifference curve to map this out. Um, this is not exactly how an indifference curve is supposed to be used, but we're using it as, as a proxy. Um, so how do we exchange things between good architecture and cheap architecture, right? Like how do people assess that balance? Well, you can map that with a curve and the easiest way to understand it is through its slope, through rise and run, just, just like a stair. Um, so what this is visualizing is, you know, a client who is being, is willing to reduce the quality of design by 50% if the cost is reduced by 40%. Not great, not terrible, probably, you know, a middle of the road client or something like that. Um, the second client is a lot worse, right? Because this is a client that will um, reduce quality of design by 50% um, for a 10% drop in cost. So um, I've certainly had clients like that. Um, maybe some other people have too. Um, but, you know, these are the clients that don't really care about design and they're just you know good enough is good enough they're just willing to kind of like pass over everything if it if it saves a few bucks um and that's kind of tragic and i know that a lot of architects live with that frustration on a daily basis um so um how does this play out in terms of you know the competition between you know human architects and generative design um well we can also map this over time so if we assume that you know human is the standard, that's 100%. That is the talent and capability and vision of a human architect. And we've got, you know, generative design, either with human assistance or without, that's rising. And we commit to the idea that it'll never get there, right? It will never reach human capability, no matter how much time we give it, it's just gonna be 90% of what an architect can be. Um, we're here, we're living in the yellow zone where capabilities of this technology is rising very quickly, but at the same time, like we know that it's, it's just never going to get there. Okay, fine. How does that compare to cost? Well, the costs of a human architect, human design is going up steadily as you expect it would with inflation, hopefully, you know, a raise once in a while. Um, the cost of generative AI is dropping precipitously. Um, and has been for decades and will likely continue to do so. Um, so when you take the ratio of cost to, you know, whatever that design quality is, and these numbers are arbitrary, understand, like you can substitute your own numbers if you really want to, but the effect will be the same. Um, you get cost over quality of human architect kind of rising steadily because, you know, the quality is, is, is what it is. That's the standard. And costs are, are rising um, at you know slow rate, inflation, something like that. Um, but the cost over quality of AI is dropping. Um, so the quality is getting better and the cost is coming down, which creates this very, very sharp curve towards the bottom. And that creates a whole different set of problems um, for architects because all of a sudden you're not choosing between these two cheapo clients. You've got a different dynamic. Um, now you've got a position where a client can reduce the quality of design by 
um, and achieve a 50% reduction in cost. Uh, and that becomes a lot more seductive and I think potentially disastrous because we don't want design that's 90%, right? And we want like the best design to be out there in the world. But as you make it more and more attractive by hacking the cost, 50%, 80%, 90%, um, I think it's going to seduce a lot of people. All right, myth number four, AI won't be a threat in the future because of something it can't do now. Um, we've heard a lot of this too. So from Kermit Baker, the chief economist of the AAA, AI can't pour concrete, paint a wall, or install flooring. Um, momentarily setting aside the fact that uh, it actually can pour concrete and paint a wall and install flooring. It does all of those things today. Um, we can think about this whole thing a little bit more abstractly in terms of what AI is going to do in the future. So AI is growing exponentially. What that means, uh, you know, what rate, uh, we don't know. And it's not necessary for this illustration, but you've got AI growing at an exponential rate in terms of its learning, its capability, um, everything that it can do, et cetera. Humans grow at a linear rate, um, which is probably not a big deal if you're you know, over 50. Um, so if you're an architect and you know, you're pretty senior, it probably fuels that speculation that you have that AI can't actually compete with your knowledge and skills because it can't, like not now, probably not ever, because you're going to retire prior to the point where AI ever gets to that level. So the skills that you have um, after you know, 40, 50 years of practice remain valuable today and will probably remain valuable for you know the next couple of years or 10 years or, or something like that. And that's probably why older architects seem to be a lot less concerned about all of this AI business. But the picture is different for senior architects. So someone with 10, 15, 20 years of experience, they're going to have their growth cut off um, at some point by you know this red wall of AI growth. And AI will grow to the point where it assumes the, the capabilities that that senior architect actually has. That senior architect never really gets a chance to ascend to the level of professional maturity and skill set that the principal architect did because their progress is essentially cut off. Much bigger problem for recent grad because someone who's graduating architecture school today has to look at the possibility that as they're out there and they're trying to build their skills and their capabilities, um, you know, they're cut off. They've got a few years in the profession, maybe 10 before the capabilities of AI exceed um, their own capabilities. So they'll never get to that skill level um, that the prior generations have, because by the time they do, AI will be better than they are at, at, at the task of, of architecture. And it's hugely problematic if you're uh, a child, you know, if you're a 16 year old and you're thinking about going into architecture, um, you're not going to get there uh, for at least another, you know, six, seven, eight years. Um, you're not going to be licensed for another 10, 12, or 15 years. And by that time, you've come in underneath the growth curve of AI. So all of this discussion about what AI can do today uh, as a measure about what it can do tomorrow, I think is a false prophet. Um, you know, we need to be looking at the growth rates of AI and understand what it's going to be able to do in the future. Um, and anytime you hear an argument, I think, um, you know, well, AI is not going to be a threat in the future because it can't do this thing right now. Um, I would just set it aside uh, because it's relatively nonsense. Um, all right. Final myth. Uh, we'll just do more projects. Um, this is uh, also mythological because it violates basic laws of supply and demand. Um, and I'm going to illustrate this with golf clubs um, because I think golf is an urban crime. Um, I don't play golf, by the way. Uh, apologies to anybody who does. So let's imagine a golf club market and you have three suppliers, right? And they all produce about 20 golf club sets per quarter. Um, this creates an overall industry supply of 60 golf clubs, uh, golf club sets per quarter. And the demand is also 60 golf club sets. Perfect supply and demand like in balance, right? Um, now, uh, what happens when supplier B comes upon a technology that allows them to triple their production of golf clubs? Um, they're producing 60 a quarter. Well, the overall supply goes to 100. But then what happens to the demand? Um, does it also swell to meet that supply? Um, no, 
um, I mean, very rarely with very specific things um, does demand rise to meet supply. That almost never happens. One scenario is that supplier B puts their competition out of business and just gobbles up all of the work as may happen in architecture as you know, big technologically advanced firms adopt this new technology faster and just decide to you know, take over everybody else's business. Um, I think the more likely scenario is that all of this extra golf club sets go in the trash, right? Because there is no market to actually absorb what they're doing. Um, this is the key thing. Um, demand is fixed. Just because you produce three times as many golf club sets doesn't mean that, you know, people are going to go out and buy three times as many golf club sets because how many do you need? Like people are not going to spontaneously start playing golf because you've produced all these extra golf sets. And I think that's the problem with a lot of this thinking around design is that, um, you know, just because we can do the design a lot faster and produce more of it doesn't mean that people want more of it. The demand for design services is fundamentally driven by the demand for buildings. Now, the demand for buildings is driven by all these things, but it's also related to the money supply. So the money supply and the demand for buildings combine to create the demand for design services. Um, and this has no relationship to anything that's going on within the AEC world. The software we use, how fast it is, like whatever Dynamo scripts you've written, um, none of that influences demand at all. Um, you know, maybe in some very, very peripheral ways. But the point is that, you know, our work as designers, as architects is trapped between like the money supply, the money that's coming in, the demand for buildings on the demand side. Um, and, you know, what we do inside doesn't fundamentally change either of those things. So if you produce 10 times as many coffee makers, um, it doesn't mean people need 10 times as many coffee makers. Um, if we could produce 10 times as much design, doesn't mean people need 10 times as many buildings. Um, and that is the fundamental constraint that I'm most worried about is people think, oh, well, we're just going to do, you know, more and more work. We can't, there's not a demand. Um, <clears throat> there's no way to sort of justify all of that extra work. Um, so let's wrap this up by looking at the brighter side of disaster. I love teaching disaster because I think disaster is fundamentally optimistic and we have thousands of years of history to prove it. Ever since our ancestors started utilizing floods on the Nile River Delta to kickstart the Holocene and you know invent civilization, humanity has had this really productive relationship with disaster. Lisbon, 1755, suffered earthquake, tsunami and a citywide fire at the same time. Um, they all kind of caused each other. Well, one earthquake caused the rest of them. But anyway, uh, very, very tenuous time. You know, the seeds of the enlightenment were there, um, but it happened on All Saints Day. So a lot of the very religious people uh, in Portugal were saying to themselves, oh my God, we didn't pray enough. And that's why this is happening. Um, let's, you know, return to religious fundamentalism and all of this stuff. Um, and the course of history was changed by the Marquis de Pombol, um, who basically drove the response to this particular earthquake. Now, the earthquake, fire, et cetera, already had become well known throughout Europe. It had influenced a lot of thinkers because it provoked a question. You know, this horrible, horrible trifecta of disaster happens on All Saints Day. Does that mean that there is a God or does that mean that there is no God? And like, what should we actually be doing about this condition? Um, so Marquis de Pombo leaned in the Enlightenment direction, um, and we should thank him for it. Um, so he developed early approaches to seismology. He had horses, uh, riders on horses, go out in radial directions and interview people about the length of the shaking and what happened and everything like that, so they could establish an epicenter. Um, he created the Pomboline style, or you know, had it created. Um, which we still use today in, in many parts of the world. Um, so I've ever seen this kind of construction like that really became popularized after this, this Lisbon art, uh, earthquake at the direction of the Marquis. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, kind of jump-started the Enlightenment, right? I mean, this was a huge historical event told us like when an act of God happens, we can respond with design. You know, we can actually design that particular disaster away and protect ourselves in the future. And nowhere has this ever been more evident than the citywide fire. And it's an old memory, um, but 
we used to have those all the time, right? Cities would just burn to the ground. Um, and that was it. Um, London, of course, in 1666, Chicago in 1871, Baltimore, 1904, um, San Francisco in 1906. Um, this used to have cities would like burn to the ground. And now it's inconceivable that anything like that would ever happen. It's tough to even imagine how that might happen. So what changed? Um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire in 1911 was a horrible fire and a tragedy that inspired a public outcry, which in turn sponsored, uh, provoked legislation about, you know, new building codes, new ways to design buildings. So fire sprinklers, emergency exit doors, having alleys, um, you know, this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I love telling this story because, you know, it's an example to me of the way that urban planners and architects and engineers quite literally designed a disaster out of existence. And, you know, our cities exist today because we adapted to that particular disaster. I've said that disaster is fundamentally op optimistic because it is, um, because we have a chance of deciding what to do. So, you know, is... The future of architecture and AI apocalypse, um, I think it, it just depends on what we design. Um, so um, apologies for running a bit long, um, but thank you to everyone and uh, especially to, to my hosts um, and love to start a discussion. Eric, that was, that was, that was fabulous. Um, really fabulous. And don't apologize for taking so long. It was, it was, uh, um, I think what I mean, some of those I, some of those notions I've kind of had before, but I've never been a systematic in, in investigating them uh, through the lens of, um, you know, well, much more kind of like a, a structured uh, analysis. Um, um, and I think it was it was really very, very instructive. Um, uh, I, I just uh, there are a number of things that that, that come up. Um, I think that. Um, uh, what I think what it points towards, I mean, the emphasis of seems the background concern was the issue of cost. That seems to be the, the driver in many ways, or the primary concern, certainly as far as the client concern is concerned. And uh, it kind of, in some senses, echoed um, uh, the Suskin's work on, on what's going to happen in the future in terms of the professions and, and the primary driver of change. Is going to be economics. People just want to get it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and that is always kind of, in a way, I think there is a background condition um, that makes us as a profession, architects, very vulnerable, and that is the lack of concern about costs. I wrote a long time back a book called *The Anesthetics of Architecture*, which is about how we tend to see things through a rose-tinted lens and, and just see them in terms of their beauty. You know, and that rinses out often concerns about um, uh, socioeconomic, uh, political, environmental disasters or whatever. It just rinses that out and we just look at it. Um, so, uh, and, and I mean, whatever. I mean, you could think about, um, you know, looking out over the Pacific Ocean um, and seeing this kind of pink mushroom cloud, which is clearly a kind of nuclear explosion. The French testing out their, their nuclear weapons over the Bikini Atoll or whatever, and look at it and say, wow, what a beautiful pink mushroom cloud kind of thing. And yeah. that is, I think, that is kind of endemic in, in, uh, uh, with the problem in some senses of, of architects. We see things and say, wow, isn't it beautiful? And the client was going thinking things about how much it costs. And the classic kind of issue is, is you, you come up with a design and uh, um, my, my chair at Cambridge would, would come up with this, this argument. And he said, and the client would say, but, but, you know, but how much does it cost? Don't worry about that. You know, if you get this, you'll get a beautiful building. And the problem is that is really the issue. The aestheticization runs through the architectural culture. And I think it also affects architects themselves in the sense that we are so happy doing beautiful designs. We don't worry too much about our own pay. In fact, we've got no say over that, really. There's nothing to, um, to effectively um, protect fees, nothing at all. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, so that it becomes the kind of the, the, the crucial issue. And I, and I think you're absolutely right in, in pinpointing, um, or, or at least it seems to be the back, the, the core of your argument was really about economics, about cost, supply and demand. And I, I totally agree with the, um, with the, your, your golf, uh, golf uh, clubs kind of analogy. Um, 
there are no they're going they're going to be no more buildings required um so don't assume that you're going to be employed more in the future um anyway maybe i'll just put that comment in there if you want to yeah i mean I, I i agree i would refine it um a little bit and um i'll tell you a story you know i, I practiced architecture for for five years uh, commercially before going to graduate school and i went to um do my master's in architecture and, and an MBA. And of course, as a young architect, you know, we were always talking about cost because, you know, clients were always beating us over the head, like, you know, this costs too much, this costs too much. And, you know, I I adopted that that common sentiment among architects that, you know, architects care about, you know, the building, the design, and, you know, clients care about the cost. And then, you know, I went to business school and, you know, it's just kind of like, rapid rapid fire you know doing case studies and everything like that and no one ever talked about cost and i was like what the fuck is going on because i thought you know I, I would go to business school and like we would just be talking about this um and i think that's where i, I developed my sensibilities about value you know value being the difference between what something is worth and what something costs in there and you know, we make decisions about what we buy based on the differential, right? You know, the relative um, value of two things. So when you go out to buy shoes, um, you know, you don't buy like the best pair of shoes that's ever been invented. You don't buy like the least expensive shoes that's ever been invented. You you look at that. And I think that to what you said about the, the sort of viewpoint difference between architects and their clients, that gets amplified because, you know, from an architect's perspective, the cost is immaterial because they're not paying for it. The worth of the building is very much tied up in its aesthetics. So, you know, we want it to be beautiful to us because that that is that is good for us. Um, but the worth and cost equation is completely different for the client. One, they're paying the costs. Um, and two, you know, the worth is it encompasses things other than than just aesthetics. You know, I mean, there's rental payments from from tenants um, you know there's tax like i mean there's all sorts of other things going on but i think that you know you're you're absolutely right and uh, thank you for bringing up suskin too uh you know they've been hugely influential in my work as well um because you know fundamentally you know you may love architecture um you may be the best architect in the world but when alternative technologies create a solution that is 90 percent is good but 10 percent of the cost like that that's all she wrote i mean like 99 percent of clients are just going to flock over there and you would do the same thing you know yeah I, I would just add to that that i i you know i think that um the questions of aesthetics we assume that everyone shares our aesthetic we assume that but actually yeah, fair um, enough. <laughs> uh, they don't i mean i i don't know uh uh, I've got a relative who um, uh, I have a pair of uh, I had a pair of Nike yellow shoes and I I, I went into the, the to Zaha's office and Patrick said where did you get those I want a pair of those and uh, I, I got a I got some some flack when I went to went to one of my relatives' homes what are you wearing yellow shoes for what you're not a teenager anymore kind of like you know <laughs> but, so you know I think this is something that is and it, and it's it's actually in some senses so we assume everyone's going to share that aesthetic and they they. You know, I think I would say that postmodernism has meant that we're kind of more aware of appearances and so on, I would say. But on the whole, no one actually quite shares that same aesthetic. And to my mind, this was the tragedy of the Bauhaus in some senses. That they mm. thought that they would transform society, give um, the the modern citizen what they wanted. Um, uh, but the problem was it was it was expensive. You know, it was yep. it was you know if you go to the Bauhaus now in Dessau, you will see all these beautiful kind of whatever they are um, designer objects, uh, and, and, or you find them anywhere. You find them in museum shops all over the world, and fine if you've got the money to pay for your uh, Philip Stark lemon squeezer or whatever. But actually, you know, it's actually expensive. Whereas yeah. IKEA, and I think there's a lot of lessons for us from IKEA. Yeah, they produce something that actually did what Adolf Loos claimed he wanted to do by reducing the ornament, you save on costs and produce something that is much cheaper. Of course, there are other um, kind of smart um, uh, 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 factors they introduced. I mean, flat packing things, allowing you to assemble themselves and, and all that other things means that IKEA is now populating the living rooms of many, many people, but not because of the aesthetic, because of the fact that it's going to be cheaper and that's the best way to do it. And uh, 
So you do actually, and maybe you do begin to influence people's taste and they say, oh, I quite like Ikea or whatever, but you do it through a fundamentally different mechanism. I think that is absolutely uh, central um, to how we operate. So I I, um, I I really appreciate that. And and, and, and as the layered way which you, you address uh, the question about cost itself. Um, let me just simply say, uh, if anyone's got any questions, um, please put them in. Uh, so we've got a YouTube audience, and we've got a Zoom audience. The YouTube ones, if you could put in the into the chat, and we can relay them here. I wanted to um, pick up on on something which I thought was, I mean, maybe as a way of kind of um, not just my work, but maybe something you could add into the mix. And, and that is to say, there was um, a recent study um, that was done um, by essentially a group of economists of, of sorry, sociologists um uh from harvard mit and the guy called ethan mollick who is from i think mm -hmm. UPenn, um was also part he's an ai expert i think he's at the um the, the, the business school there at um uh, upenn anyway uh, they did a, a study um on a consulting group boston consulting group mm -hmm. and what they were doing was attempting to measure, now we don't know how to measure these things, but sociologists do, to measure the impact of using AI. And mm -hmm. uh, they were able to come up with some result. They were able to quantify it in some way. Uh, and I think this is probably the first of many uh, many studies. I'm sure there'll be a lot of them. Um, and of course, they weren't necessarily dealing with, with, um, with the design as such, although they were that was vaguely included in their in their study because they they asked the the, the this group to um uh it to suggest a new a new line of of of, of footwear um um responding in some way to whatever no, dot 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 um another line and uh, so it was kind of creativity in very loosely was part of that thing they were using um chat gpt to mm -hmm. um, to study this thing but what they came up with, we think, was really, really interesting, um, was a series of quite significant factors. And there is this very crude graph that uh, uh, Ethan Mollick has, has, has published on, online. Um, the whole thing was published as part of the Harvard Business School uh, journal, but but he made his own graph and, and so on, which puts it very graphically in, uh, right up. And he says, basically, and what they found, basically, it, um, the, it, it, uh, the, the, the study using AI, it was someone, a group using, control group using AI versus a control group not using AI. And those that were using AI um, finished 12.2% more tasks. So they achieved more. Um, what's more, they completed those tasks at 25.1% quicker. Now, I guess you've got to multiply those to get the real impact. You're doing more tasks and you're doing them quicker. So the overall impact is actually more significant than that and they also came up with a with the figure which i think is difficult to evaluate that it was uh 40 better quality now that's anyway you put those together those three factors um are quite significant um and as you say it's a question really ultimately the task and i you know and it's i, I something that I, I do i do um i mean that is a factor in the sense that there are there's a difference between certain tasks and other. Like for example, you, 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 your comparison was between the task and the the job itself or the profession. I think that renderers are in a lot of trouble right now. Yeah. Because there are a number mm -hmm. of um, tools out there. You put in a sketch. I mean, famously, Tim Fu was using LookX, and he put in a, a, a mm -hmm. crumpled piece of paper and and, and <laughs> kind of looked at it and produced a Gary building, produced a Zaha building, yeah. <laughs> a Morphosis building, based on that. And each yeah. one was. And you can do that now. So, so I think certain clearly it's, there is a differential in there. One has to take that into account. Um, but very, very significant. And uh, it would be interesting to find out what that figure was. Um, I once um, was talking about this with, with one of the developers of AI software. I won't mention her name, but uh, she once said, and she wanted to retract it, that some person using AI could achieve as much as five not using AI. And I, I, I it's a little bit of a um, and she was worried about that, that information getting out there because uh, it might put off people from using AI. Um, mm. But nonetheless, um, there is a, there is a significant difference in, in, in what you can do. Um, so I don't think the quality necessarily is going to be that important in terms of aesthetic, shall we say. Although, uh, I mean, I think that you could judge quality in, in other terms. And I think these are really hugely significant factors. And, and we need to do a study, I think, in architecture for that. Um, That'd be good. 
I mean, okay. Uh, any 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 comments? I've got a few more, couple more points. We'll we'll, we'll open up. <laughs> We've got some questions coming in from the, from from YouTube as well. So, but uh, um, yeah. Uh, so um, anyway, I think there's 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 the concern, I, and that's kind of connected in some way to 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 all those issues. The one thing that I think that I would question about your um, approach and, and 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 well i don't mean critical but i think one Please. maybe a suggestion and uh, you, you mentioned the law of diminishing returns and that's of course it was kurtzweil's um what he followed and a lot of people are um uh following on from moore's law um now for those of you who don't know moore's law gordon moore was an industrialist who was made a comment it wasn't a law as such but made a comment back in the 60s on observation shall we say that that in terms of circuit boards uh the number of conductors uh, the, the transistors on the on the, on, the, on the circuit board would double every two years and the price would come down by half which meant that this was exponential change um so if it's if it's that factor um you would be instead of going one, two, three, four, five, you'd go one, two, four, eight, sixteen. And there's a huge difference between five and sixteen. Uh, it's exponential change. And that has been applied more recently um, to these large language models. Now I want to mention those again in a second, because I think these are absolutely hugely significant. Um Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google. Um, made the comment that these large language models uh, are are uh, um, increasing in their capabilities, going faster than Moore's law, and, and that was the comment he made. I don't think that Moore's law is relevant in this context because it's tying it to some kind of production and, and a kind of economics. Now, the key question when it comes to capabilities is, in my view, anyway, the speed of learning the speed of learning. Now, this is something um, that Jeffrey Hinton um, comments on. And Jeffrey Hinton is known largely as the, the godfather of AI. Certainly he was the one who was promote, who was working on neural networks and um, or what we call now deep learning at a time when that approach was out of favor. Um, it, it wasn't working, everyone abandoned it in favor of a, of a different logic, uh, symbolic AI based on, on, on logic and so on. Um, but it really all it required was that was a, was a change in terms of the um, the technology. Uh, and uh, as soon as we got GPUs invented, then suddenly the capabilities of computers was and the speed of computers was vastly, vastly increased. And these neural networks worked. OK, so yeah. that's a background to him. But he has made the, the comment um, uh, recently and we, he's been in the news because he resigned from Google in order to sound a warning. Um, and. His warning, basically, or, or part of his warning, was the speed at which AI, which computers could learn, because it, it, the way that it works, he said, it, and I don't, I need to look at this what, into, into this further, is that it shares information with a, a thousand other computers at once. Now, I don't know why he mentioned a thousand, not a million, whatever, but it shares information. Uh, with a thousand um, computers at once, whereas if I'm sharing information um, with you, it's it's a one on one. So, but a thousand, a thousand to a thousand others. Now that somehow reminds you of COVID in some senses. If you share COVID um, mm -hmm. with, and the, the key issue was the what they call the ER ratio. And if it was more than one, be worried. If it was less than one, you're kind of okay because the, it's the spread is going down, whatever. Now, we never had an R ratio of 1,000. Now, I'm not even sure that figure's correct, but this is the real problem. It is the capabilities of these large language models um, that is exploding, and it's exploding at a rate that we cannot even conceive. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just uh, put, throw that at you, Eric, and see what... Sure, sure. Let me let me react to a few things. Um, first, the... Um, the uh diminishing returns uh, diagram and, and the thread there, then that, that's not actually, that's irrespective of AI or, or no AI. Um, you know, the diminishing returns is just an economic phenomena that exists either way. So um, that's that's separate. The, the Moore's law thing, yes. And, and we need to get the word out about that because I think there's still people who think that Moore's law is, is relevant. Um, it's not, things are moving much, much faster than that. I mean, Kurtzweil puts it at a double exponential or a triple exponential. I mean, these are growth rates that are very hard for people to to understand. 
um, like intuitively. And I don't mean like people other than me. I mean, I have a hard time, like the human brain has a hard time. Um, here's a benchmark that I always use. Um, Stanford's um, whatever annual AI survey that they do, um, they put the doubling of artificial intelligence capability rolling in, you know, algorithmic development, um, advances in cloud computing, like all the things, like the raw capability of, of AI uh, doubling every four and a half months. Now, if something's doubling every four and a half months, that's a million X in seven years. Um, so when people say, hey, you know, AI is like, there's nothing to be afraid of and it's insulting that AI could actually like, you know, ape the performance of a human designer. I agree. I'm like, yeah, you know, at this point, but do I believe that that an AI that's a million times more powerful than what we have today might be capable of designing a building? Yes. Yes, I do. And I'm very, very concerned about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, well, you just deconstructed uh, another myth, Neil, uh, you know, this myth around Moore's law. Um, I think we, we have a responsibility to, to kind of get the word out that some of this, some of these um, Pollyannish positions are, are, are based on, you know, data and ideas that are actually outdated. So maybe I could just throw throw that back at you. And, and, and I mean, I, I love that video, um, the 24 minute video, uh, but it struck me that it doesn't have to be 24 minutes. Um, and I base this on, I mean, I, it's what you're doing basically is you're recording a conversation um, and which, and you're, you're showing it between this, these AI agents and uh, yeah. their, um, but but the, the twenty four minutes space is basically taken up in 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 showing them talking to one another, whereas actually the speed of the the operations could be pretty yeah. instantaneous. Now I, I was alarmed by the what we now know as large language models and and, and the speed of operations. Um, several years ago, um, in the world of AI, one of the great moments um, when we kind of a wake up call it was called. A Sputnik moment um, mm. when Sputnik basically was a wake-up call for the American, the, the Americans in the space race, and it led to the foundation of NASA. Um, I mean, holy shit! The Soviets were suddenly sending a, 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 right. a, yeah. a, a satellite to orbit, and America was nowhere near that. Um, and and that was a wake-up call. So, in terms of your kind of like, there's something good that comes out of it. Well, NASA came out of that particular moment. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, this this particular game, it was, um, and we, we were not, it wasn't really on our radar because it was a game of Go, a match of Go. And we don't really play Go, but they do in Asia. And there was okay. this match, um, Alpha Go, developed by DeepMind of London versus um, uh, Lisa Doll, who was kind of, this followed on from the Gary Kasparov chess match. And he was the kind of Gary Kasparov, shall we say, of, of Go. And AI trounced him. And that was the wake up call for all Go playing nations. And, yeah. the, um, the Chinese immediate president, she said, okay, in, 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 in by 2030, we are going to catch up with the Americans and overtake them and so on and so on and so forth. So that was kind of like a hugely sort of um, significant um, moment in sort of in, 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 in wake up. But the more important one was something that wasn't really mentioned at all, which was the follow up. And the follow up was this was the next model of, of AlphaGo, which is called AlphaGo Zero. That first of all, it, it wasn't documented, it wasn't on TV and whatever, but it was um, it went under our radar. But that one, it beat AlphaGo 100 games to zero. Right, okay. I remember. <laughs> better, that's better. But the important thing was it learned to do things um, without being trained to do so. It was not taught the rules of Go. And this talks about the emerging capabilities, which we should come back to in a moment. But the other aspect of how it learned, it was playing games of Go against itself. And I think the total was uh, it was four point nine million over four over three days. Yeah, and that sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot. Um, but the real point is, it is a lot. I mean, you go down to it. You know, it basically it's twenty games of go per second. Now that is very very significant. It is we it's mind bogglingly fast. Yeah. mind bogglingly fast. And I would say, and I don't even know why it took so long. Frankly, I mean, why? Did, how could it even yeah. take you know that much? Time? So my point would be with, with that video is the actual calculations were pretty instantaneous and it yeah. wasn't 24 minutes of calculations. I mean, that was what it took to show the operations happening in terms of discourse, shall we say, but the calculations were pretty instantaneous. And that really yeah. is, um, anyway, that, that was what my, that would be my comment on the, on the video, which I, I thought was a fabulous video anyway. No, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's, um, 
you know, there's something evolutionary about it, right? You, you know, we just, we have trouble, the human brain has trouble, like kind of wrapping our heads around, you know, exponentials and, and these sorts of things. So, you know, we got to support each other and like check each other and say like, yeah, that whole 24 minute video could have been under a second, you know, if it was just two AIs, you know, talking to each other and, and designing a building or something like that. Um, in my own writing, I refer to this as the million monkey problem, right? Where we've all heard that adage about, you know, if a million monkeys were banging on a million uh, typewriters for a million years, would they at some point write Hamlet? Um, and, you know, maybe you think yes, maybe you think no, but a billion monkeys working on a billion typewriters for a billion or a trillion, right? you know, those are the scales that that we're into now. So, um, yeah, I think I think we need to be very, very concerned. And it's interesting that you brought up uh, the the Go match, because that was one of my uh, initial inspirations of getting started on this project, because, you know, there were there were architects in the ether who were saying, no, like, you can't compete with architecture. Architecture is just like too complicated. And like, well, you know, AI is like beating world champions at Go. It's doing protein folding. You know, it's solving all these like cancer research problems. And, you know, architecture is plenty, plenty complicated, but I'm not sure that it's more complicated than everything. You know, like it's not like the last thing that, that AI is going to figure out. So, um, yeah, yeah, we got a big jump. Yeah, no, so one more point for me, and then we'll open up to the, the other questions sure, sure. from the audience. But, I, you know, I absolutely totally agree also that you're picking up on what are called emergent capabilities or mm -hmm. emergent abilities. I think these are things that are um, hugely significant. And I was I was intrigued by what you discovered in terms of what AI had learned how to do. You know? yeah. um, so just to say for those who don't know, I mean, I'm not even sure that the, the term emergence is intended to be taken the way that I've taken it, but um, I... In my work years ago on, on swarm intelligence, and, and in, I came across the term emergence, which is about that Stephen, uh, that John Holland had initially kind of written about it as a kind of principle whereby uh, things start emerging out of any multi agent system that are unpredictable and, and not expected. And classically, you think about a, a flock of birds and the way that it, it produces this amazing. Sure. Area uh, acrobatics, but it's also been taken more recently to apply these to these uh, mysterious abilities that go back to that alpha go zero. It taught itself to play go, and you know that the right that that was when the alarm bells should have been sounding because now we're discovering through these large language models it's this developing similar uh, capacity capabilities. It yeah. can learn languages and translate. That is pretty astonishing. It does it. It does it actually. I mean, emergence itself is a kind of a rather mysterious thing, and we can observe it. We can't really explain it scientifically yet, but nonetheless, we can see this thing happening. Um, now, it can learn to translate, and it can learn to write code. I mean, that's that's very significant. That's huge. Yeah. Um, so I got a friend from college who who was uh, who used to run the biggest translation agency uh, in the world, and he sold his company two years ago, because you could see that AI was going to be able to do <laughs> that. Um, and uh, I've been exploring that myself in terms of the translation of, of some of my books. And it's incredibly cheap, incredibly fast, yeah. even with a human editor to come in and go and uh, check all the things and so on. Um, so there's 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 that. But I mean, uh, uh, it's so it, it has this capacity to do these things. And I claim, and it's very imperfect at the moment, I, I would claim, though, that there are moments in which it has learned how to design it seems to have learned the, the rules of composition um in the sense of mid journey and dali particularly mid journey it's coming up with some pretty impressive designs not everyone i mean about you know only one in about 50 is really good mm. but nonetheless it is surprising that it's doing those things um and you could only assume there are a lot of other things that we don't know what it's doing but it's doing you know it's it's it's, it's looking yeah. at the data and understanding systems and putting them together i actually put this question to to when you heard yesterday i said well what about i mean could it not also learn how you do the plumbing or how you do you know other aspects of architectural design <clears throat> and, and 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 she was saying well the, the difficulties the three dimensions that's when errors start creeping in and uh it's it's fine with language i mean language it doesn't matter too much if you're slightly out there's a lot of tolerance there but with architectural drawings and things that is the challenge. It's not there yet. But I do think, I do think that these emergent capabilities are, I mean, they're fascinating. Um, and uh, they don't sound particularly interesting, nor indeed do large language models, but 
they are, are astonishing. And just one final point for, for, for the audience is the large language models, they, they get these abilities not through the, the sophistication of the code because the code is quite straightforward. Right. It's based on the size of these things. And the larger they get, the more they seem to manifest these things. So I was just intrigued. Maybe you'd just like to comment just briefly again on, on what you discovered it was able to do that you had never predicted. Yeah, you want to hear the the wildest? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean the 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 windows and and the bathrooms and and the cost and like that that surprised me. You know that I was able to kind of like get all of that right. Um, the biggest thing that I did not put in the presentation was that um, I did find that it had some kind of three D spatial world building capability. So um, after you know, Carla had, had designed the house, you know, I drew it out, you know, I drew the floor plans as I would have drawn them based on, you know, what she was talking about and, you know, the local conditions and things like that. And then I described it to chat GPT and said, you know, if I go into, um, you know, the front hallway and make a left and go up the stairs and make a right, what room am I in? And it was like bedroom. Um, and it would get, that right so in the way that you might communicate it to an unsighted person or something like that you know i was able to to kind of articulate directions like around the house and you know across like multiple floors and, and things like that and it would seemingly understand like where it was in 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 some three-dimensional mental model um i don't know if that's an artifact of just like the language so i mean two of us um, you know, if I described to you a building like over the telephone and said, you know, these are dimensions of the building, like you could sit down and draw it out and go vice versa. So, you know, maybe it's not. Yeah, I don't know where it comes from. I haven't figured it out, but it scared the shit out of me. So Yeah, yeah. I'm just just an aside. I want to go to, to some of the questions and yeah, yeah, let's do in, it. In a moment, I want to ask um, Mitra. But just as an aside, I think the, the obvious point that needs to be reinforced is traditionally we are the ones that interpret the verbal instructions of the client right. and produce an image, which is exactly what Midjourney and Dali do. Um, they, and that's kind of worrying. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, um, Mitra um, has got a question. I don't know if you're able to use your microphone and to, to uh, um, read it out, or um, if not, um, if you can, if you can unmute yourself or I can read it for you um i don't know whether you um uh, i don't know if you've got a microphone on your on your computer um uh okay i can see you're still muted oh did someone have someone has to allow her to unmute themselves um okay okay mitra hello hello everyone hi uh, hi <laughs> thank you so much for the great lecture uh and actually i have a question about um uh, and actually, we have uh, these days we are facing an increase uh, in the use of the social networks. So uh, the analysis uh, of uh, in invisibility of the data and social network uh, could be significant. For example, um, in um, urban uh, studies, we have the geolocated ge geolocation data, including the GPS or data about connection with uh, local Wi-Fi uh, equipment. Uh, so my question is, would it be possible to collect uh, data from social networks for architects? Uh, and where is the, uh, the data um, stored? Um, would it be possible to collect data from social networks um, for what, for design purposes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I imagine that's much more of a social and legal problem than it is a technological one. Um, you know, your, your social networks already know everything about where you are and what you're doing and how fast you're moving and what stores you visit and, and all those other things. Um, because, you know, you signed off on a license agreement that, that allows them to have and use that data. Um, I think in order for, architects and designers to use it at other scale at any significant scale we'd have to have a similar sort of arrangement i mean the idea of a municipality collecting that data on its citizens for use by designers 
uh, frightened me a little bit because um, they would almost certainly use it for other things. Um, but I've seen it used to brilliant effect actually in, in disaster zones. Um, after the Haiti 2010 earthquake, Port-au-Prince was a city of about two, three million people, sorry. Um, and once the earthquake struck, you know, it, it destroyed most of Port-au-Prince and, you know, people fanned outward, um, you know, from the city and then at varying rates started to, to come back as recovery progressed. Um, and Digicel, the main phone carrier there, actually had that data as a result of like, you know, having everybody's SIM card uh, in a database. So, you know, we could understand how quickly, you know, people were moving back and into what neighborhoods and, and this sort of thing. So, I mean, from an urban and, and from a design perspective, that data is enormously useful. Um, I think we just have to make the case that we should have it um, as designers and that we can put it in, into good use. Uh, just to the side, um, uh, Eric, the I think the one of your disasters, just to, I, maybe you didn't know this, but the, the Great Fire of London, actually it came off the great plague and it actually effectively got rid of the great plague so maybe you had two yeah. disasters one one counter the other um so we've got a, um, a number of questions from from youtube and uh i think these are separate questions anyway first is you can see them in the chat if you want to look at them um uh from mandu tiger uh in youtube um some excellent points, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Um, unfortunately, another influencing factor for the long term is this rising level of indifference that is poisoning creativity and quality to huge values architects pr provoke, provide. Um, uh, unfortunately, another influencing factor is, for the long term is this rising level of indifference that is poisoning creativity mm -hmm. and quality to huge values architects provide. Um. I would say, you know, Mandu Tiger, you, you're not wrong. Um, there, there's certainly a, a surplus of um, indifference in the world these days. Um, but I will um, reference um, my father and, and probably several debate coaches as well that, you know, always advise me never to argue a position that requires that that I believe or that you believe that my opponent is is somehow stupid or morally corrupt or um, ignorant or something like that um, because it's an easy out right um, the problem with architecture has nothing to do with architecture it's all these other people and the fact that they don't care about this and they don't care about that um, that may be true it just doesn't go anywhere I mean it's kind of fatalistic for the profession if you think about it because you know if you imagine that that architects are, you know, these passionate designers concerned with beauty and progress and, you know, everybody else is indifferent to such things, then why be an architect? You know, I mean, like you, you need a world to pay fees to design things. Um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, when I'm confronted with questions like that, you know, I ask myself, well, um, how do you, how do you make indifferent people different? Or, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it making different people like actually care. Um, I think you, you have to find the ways to speak in their language and to speak to to their priorities. Um, that's actually why I went to business school, you know. Um, you know, I went to get an MBA and people thought I wanted to be a developer. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I never have. Um, but it struck me as a good decision because I wanted to be able to defend our work in their language, right? Because when I was a practicing architect, you know, the whole design team would come up with all these great ideas and everything. And then, you know, at some meeting somewhere, there's some like 30 year old with a clipboard and an Excel spreadsheet. And it's like, we're not doing this. We're not doing that. And I started to ask myself, well, who's really designing this building? You know, um, and I didn't have the vocabulary or the skill set to actually argue with that person in their language. Um, so I went to business school to learn that. So uh, Mandu, just to, to tie it off, I, I mean, I would suggest that you think about the people that you think are standing in opposition to design and ask yourself, like, how do I convince them that design is valuable in their language, you know, um, with their value system? So. Oh, great, great point, Eric. I think that, um, just a comment from, uh, the UN Studio discovered that one of the, the successful ways of speaking to the client on their own language was to diagram things, and they would be much more convinced by the diagrams than the designs themselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so we have a um, another question from the chat. Again, great. Do get a lot of praise here for this talk. It was a fabulous <laughs> talk. Um, great talk. And thank you. I have a question, but more of, of wanting to know more about your opinion. Do you think that there are safe havens against the AI and architecture disasters? Are they physical places? Should we as architects look for a way to design to make us sound uh, from what AI could do against the profession? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a name attached to that? No, there's uh, uh, no. There's All no. right. Well, to whomever asked that question, um, I think that um, architects fundamentally need to be thinking about expansion, and I think that exists in along several axes. Um, you know, one is is a kind of domain expansion. I think there's a great opportunity to actually reclaim a lot of the territory that we ceded during the 20th century to other professions. And, you know, we had to spin off interiors and landscape architecture and construction management, owners reps, and, you know, all these other things because shit got too complicated. And we also just wanted to spend more time designing. Um, and I think it's unfortunately eroded a lot of the authority of an architect in that overall design process. So I think there's an opportunity there to call some of that back and to say, like, look, with these augmented tools, like, we can now do the construction management bit. Like, we can do the interiors bit. Uh, you, you know, we can do all these different things. Now, all those other professions are going to be saying the same thing. So we have to find a way to work that out. Um, but ultimately, you know, we can expand in that direction from a domain standpoint. Um, I think geographic expansion is, is another one. Um, most of the architects in the world are in places where the least architects are needed the least. Um, you know, the, the global South is going to need something like, I don't know, like a billion units of housing in the next 25 years. Um, and there's not necessarily like the infrastructure there to support good design for, for all of them. And I think, you know, maybe technology offers a route to that so that, you know, someone born in a slum in Lagos now has access to good design. Um, what does that mean? How do you accomplish that without, you know, fully like techno enabled colonialist strategy? I'm not really sure, um, but, you know, through my work, I know like most of the world really, really needs design and they can't get it. Um, so hopefully that is another axes of expansion. The third one I'll mention is is actually digital and, and metaversal. And I'm not a metaverse fanboy uh, by any uh, scrap of the imagination, but I do believe that the metaverse is inevitable, that it's coming sooner or later. And that once it does, we're going to need a strategy to marry design strategies in the real world with the metaversal world. So if you're designing for a client like, Nike, you know, they're going to have a metaversal store and they're going to have a regular store and augmented reality in their physical store. They're going to want all of that stuff to work together, right? So how do architects start to think about digital experiences and how those complement, you know, physical spaces? So, I mean, I think there's, there's lots of, that's just three, there's probably some more, but I, I think there's lots of ways that we can look at doing new things or doing old things or doing unprecedented things that haven't been invented yet. Um, the part that makes me worry, the part that makes me think that we might be in a disaster is architects looking at these sorts of technologies as ways to just do what we're already doing just faster and cheaper. Like that's, that's a race to the bottom. Like there's no good outcome there. Um, so I think fundamentally the safe place is everywhere except architecture. Like look out. Uh, chart new territory, explore new civilizations, um, design housing for the moon, like, you know, whatever it is, like, you got to go out there and use this technology that we've never seen before to do things that we've never done before. Uh, just if you, I was struck by your, your video um, uh, conversation, which would, actually would be great to see the whole thing because it was so interesting, but it's out there anyway for those who want to see um, was actually effectively the architect became the construction manager there. He was talking to the to the construction person, which is quite unusual. I mean, normally there's this very adversarial um, role, and now increasingly, in, in certainly in the UK, 
most contracts are design built and the and and the developers in charge you know so we've surrendered that idea that we used to have of being the, the person that's what the word architect oh. means literally um from the ancient greek as alberti reminded us you know the person in charge and we've surrendered that but we could do that and i all would also say we could also become the de developer i think that's an area that is probably very very well paid um that we could also um take over um or indeed, the person apparently selling the property gets the most money. So we were going to, in terms of of, of, of um, cost per hour. So there's another question here in the chat um, from Ren Re uh, Rainville uh, at uh, on YouTube. Um, do you have any suggestions on how firms should prepare for this oncoming disaster? Um, he has a second question, but let's ask that one first. Do yeah. you have any suggestions on how firms should prepare for this oncoming disaster? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um... Well, building on what I, I said in my last response in terms of like looking outward to do to do new things and unprecedented things, um, I think education is critically important at this point. You know, I mean, I I advise everybody who calls me like do your own homework. You know, read, learn something, and you know, I think ninety percent of the architects read like the same like ten design magazines like. Uh, you don't have to stop doing that, but read some other things too. Um, you know, I think most of my perspectives are informed by things that are actually going on in the tech sector and like the AI sector. And like, that's where I get my intel is like, you know, who's publishing new research on machine learning and, you know, liquid neural nets and, and these sorts of things. So that's how I personally keep an eye on, on what's happening and, and develop a, a sense of the future that I can feel comfortable with that, you know, I feel like I understand what, what might be coming. Um, I think, I don't know, not to spare Jay any sort of design media, but, you know, design could be a very conservative profession, you know, and I, I think it's the sort of thing where, you know, we're, we're radically adventurous in our work, right, within the four corners of the drafting board, I mean, metaphorically at this point, um, you know, we create whole new worlds and, and new civilizations and things like that, but then then to be, like, conservative about process and environment and, like, and the rest of the things. So um, I think that it would be good to educate oneself um, and to do your homework and to figure out what is going on outside of of architecture because that's where the real action is at the moment and it's inducing a tidal wave that's going to you know hit architecture at some point. Um, in terms of you know other like more tactical preparation, I think that would probably depend on on the specifics of you know a particular firm um, or a geography. So. Um, should we go to part two, Neil? The, yeah, um, yeah. You know, Secondly, sorry. how best can architects direct the value conversation away from the client cost concern? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the first step there is to figure out what your client values. Um, and again, I mean, I think there's there's an unfortunate, you know, mythology in architecture that, that thinks, oh, you know, the client only cares about cost. Um, I've had clients like that. I've had clients like that. Um, but clients are people and people tend to be more complex. Um, so I think different clients value different things to varying degrees. So like that's step one is, is, is knowing that. Um, the second part is, you know, don't bring a hammer to a gunfight, you know? I mean, if your client is someone who values like cost exclusively, then you need to find a way to make that argument for value in, in economic terms. And you say, you know, we want to redo the lobby and don't talk about why from an architectural standpoint, it's going to be better. Talk about like how you can charge like higher rents or like the cost comes down or, or something like that. Um, you know, if you're working with a client that, that cares about some, um, you know, other social issue or, or political issue or something, you know, find out what that is and, and make arguments to people in, in their language. I mean, I think that's one of the, and Neil alluded to it earlier, I think that's one of the biggest kind of universal mistakes that, that architects make. We, we try and convince people to follow like whatever suggestion we're making using the language of architects instead of their language. And it, it falls flat um, well, a lot of the times. Maybe I, said, I don't want to, I'm talking too much, but just to add to that, there was, I had a, there was an occasion in Cambridge once, but the, there was a, a disaster I don't know, many years ago when there was a competition and, and one of the colleges decided to forget the results of the competition and just go to a, to a builder. And they got this really very, very mm. tedious building as a result. 
But then they learned a different strategy. They discovered that actually, if you mentioned you had a, a big name architect like Foster and Partners, or whatever, it was much easier to attract funding from alumni by saying, we have got so and so. Um, and it became, on their terms, it made sense. It became an economic argument to, to improve the design. So I very much agree with that. So we have uh, James McBennett on on um, on YouTube, uh, and uh, his question, which again is in the chat: Most buildings are not designed by architects. Demand of buildings or demand for buildings uh, is far greater than demand for well-designed buildings. As the cost of design changes, surely blue ocean strategy in the middle. Um, yeah, uh, I would absolutely agree. Um, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, my my humanitarian work uh, was largely about bringing design to, to communities and to people who otherwise would never have had access to it um, by virtue of geography or, or economics. Um, but as I think you're pointing out, James, like, that includes like, you know, most Europeans, most Americans, like, you know, architectural services cannot be provided at a cost point where, you know, it makes sense for someone who is, um, you know, got a $500,000 house budget to engage with an architect. Like, that's just not going to happen. Um, but, yeah, as the cost of design comes down, does it then become possible to provide design services at, you know, a, at the same level of quality, but at a lower cost point? Um, I, you know, I was teasing an architect the other day about creating a digital version of themselves, right? So they could actually like, you know, service service clients, um, you know, essentially at zero cost um, and this sort of thing. And, you know, that technology is still probably a few years away for, you know, a sort of full package solution. But, you know, it's a taco watch. Like all of the ingredients are currently there. The technologies exist um they need to be assembled at some point in order to do that um but i think you know i'd love i love that idea i love the idea of like everybody having an architect um everybody getting the benefit and and one of the things that that's fueled my career and the thing that makes me so mad is that you know architecture is like great profession full of like so many brilliant and, and creative people and you know it's offered almost exclusively to to the rich to to the one percent you know and like we can't we can't get it out there um to everybody else um, and that's not because we suck i mean it's just because like it's it's a lengthy and expensive process so i hope that one of the things that you know architecture starts to embrace as as these technologies unfold and design costs come down is how do we give design to everybody um yeah um actually james has got a follow-up question mm -hmm. also in the chat um uh by golf analogy if two percent of buildings are designed by architects and two percent of, of golfers can afford a full set of clubs would more golf golfers justify buying a full set of clubs if the cost dropped dramatically uh -huh. Okay, interesting um i think what's implied by this question is that there are people running around out there with like two or three like golf clubs but don't have like a full set um so they go and play golf with like a couple of clubs and if the price of a set of clubs came down um they might actually buy the full set is that how you read it neil yes absolutely yeah okay um i don't play golf so maybe i'm like out of my depth here but i don't think most people like play golf with just like a few loose clubs uh, my understanding is that like you need the full set in order to properly play a game of of golf um and if that's wrong someone in the chat please correct me um i mean i think to to james is kind of like wider point um if the cost comes down do more people embrace it um sometimes yes for some goods yes um you know, energy is the prototypical example, right? The more energy we make and the lower the cost, the more people consume. Um, and there's some name for that that kind of exception um, to the laws of, of supply and demand. I think that um, if the cost of design comes down, people may embrace it further um, and more people might be interested in utilizing the services of an architect. I don't think the same necessarily applies to buildings. 
Um, because like, you know, you've got a town of what, 30, 40,000 people. It needs a hospital, right? Or at least like a regional medical center. It doesn't need four of them, right? I, I mean, we have to have some kind of justification to make the buildings that, that we make because they're expensive and they take a while and they're complicated. Um, so yeah, like I could see like a minor expansion and, and just to play on James's previous points, you know, like homeowners might have the opportunity to, you know, at the scale of a single family house for, you know, half a million dollars actually like work with an architect. Um, on the other hand, you know, that brings in the specter of like a custom designed house of some kind. I don't know how all that's actually going to play out, but James, to your point, yes, I think that probably there will be a slight expansion of the market in design services, but it will be constrained by fundamentally by the, the limits of the building market. Um, there's another question in the chat um, with no name attached to it. Um, I think that maybe the way we should think about architects within our ecosystem as a researcher, what is our role? Uh, what is our role as architects in the loop of research along with computation and big data? Will it help? Sorry, this is not very clear. Uh, will it help um, us solve problems ahead? Let me try that again. Let's me read out what he said, actually. Yeah, I'm reading it. Yeah, okay. Well. You got it. Yeah. Um, what is the our role of architects in the loop of research with computers? You think that means like the role of architects within the wider field of, of research on, you know, IT and, and data and computer science related issues? I think so. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, architects have a really amazing perspective um, and an amazing facility with certain skills that lend themselves very easily to to research. Um, so, you know, the ability to zoom in and, and zoom out really quickly and, and think small scale and big scale and, and be fluent and fluid between those things. Um, architects do that better than just about anybody I know. Um, the ability to think about time right so architecture is one of those professions where you have to like make a decision today that's like binding for 30 years and i think we we lose sight of the fact that there are very few professions where that's true you know maybe medicine or law or engineering or something like that but for the most part like you know you fuck up at your job like you've got lots of time to fix it um with architecture like your 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 issues your decisions get set in in concrete um literally um, so I think, you know, the mind of an architect lends itself very easily to, to that sort of thing. Um, I think it's about, you know, integrating with, with what's already going on. I mean, there, there's, there's already a lot of research going on in, into these things. So the question is like, what is the, the entry point for, you know, architects who want to be involved in that? Um, I think, there's a lot of data issues around buildings and cities that we haven't quite figured out. Um, we spoke about it earlier during the Q&A, um, but um, I've had the conversation many times over the past year about data um, and architects thinking, oh, well, we got all this data like from the buildings and you know, we can we can use that in, in some sort of data science way. And you know, my question is always like, you know, will it use it for what? Like what what data is going to be useful to, to anyone? Um, if you're talking about data about how people use the design that you made, um, that seems like it would be the owner's data and not yours. <coughs> so that's one problem. And if you're using the data from, you know, the designs that you made in the past, um, might might be good, but unless you're like a Gensler or HOK or something or an AECOM, you probably don't have like enough projects there to actually build any sort of machine learning data set or anything like that. So, you know, I think um, architects have a natural role based on their, you know, psychology and their disposition, um, but I'm not sure what that role is. And I think we'll, we'll have to design it. There's um, another question from Vasco, Ashik Vasco on YouTube, um, who's in Bangladesh. You should know that you've got an audience all over the world today. Awesome. Uh, um, in AI-driven architecture, how do you tackle worries about losing human-centric values and cultural nuances, especially in post-disaster reconstruction where community identity is crucial? 
Um, yeah, and I'm reading the follow-up comment, which yeah. I would agree with. I would argue that a lot of buildings have already lost a human-centric value. It did not take AI, it was modernism and effects of industrialization, post-World War II prefab and building without ornament. Um, so Ashik, I think that's a great question. Ren, I think that's a great answer and similar to the one that I would have offered. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, architecture loses human centric values all the time. And I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people don't appreciate architecture because, you know, we spent 40 years making spectacle architecture and, you know, kind of turning our attention away from the problems that, that people were actually dealing with in, in their lives. So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, how do you, how do you correct for that problem? How do you introduce human centered thinking? Um, you know, my advice is always like spend time with humans. Um, you know, we, we don't always appreciate, I don't think just how insular architecture is as a profession and how weird that is. Um, you know, we take someone when they're 19 years old and we put them in studio and frankly, a lot of architects never come out you know, like mentally, like they stay in studio for forever. Um, and, you know, they come out, graduate, they know how to walk like an architect, talk like an architect, they, you know, have cool glasses and, and wear black and, and this sort of thing. Um, but they don't necessarily like have human beings like, at the center of like whatever their their design ambition is. Um, you know, in my work, like it's it's impossible not to, you know, you can't. You can't go into a community of friendly, loving people who are having a hard time and say, like, OK, like, I'm just going to ignore all that. Um, not unless you're some kind of monster, I guess. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, the point is, um, the point am I trying to make? I think I'm advising you, Ashek, to, um, one, like, spend more time with, with people um, and, you know, to appreciate the fact that um, we don't have much human centeredness to begin with. So maybe paradoxically, AI is the way that we find it. Um, you know, I, I'm sure some of you have seen the same studies that I have where, you know, they measure the responsiveness of a human doctor and, you know, uh, a medical chat GPT, like, uh, what is it, Palm, Palm One or something, the Google One, the medical one. Um, and, you know, the respondents like drastically prefer interacting with the robot because it's perceived as being like more caring and more attentive. And it has, you know, infinite time. I mean, my doctor comes in to see me and like 30 seconds later, you know, he's he's gone like to do with another patient because our healthcare system is is fucking stupid like that. Um, but, you know, maybe the this tool like retrieves some of our humanity by you know, giving us time to be human um, and giving us time to to sit with patients and to sit with clients and and things like that. So, yeah, I don't know. That felt like a rambling response. It's a tough question. Rand, <laughs> rambling, rambling responses, Eric. This is fabulous. I just maybe to follow up on that in a way. I mean, I had um, at this last semester, I asked my, instead of asking my students to go and write an essay, I got them to ask a, to, to do a video, but they they went, I think, to chat GPT and got this. I think it, I think some, you're right, because in your article, you mentioned the fact that I think that, Ch that chat GPT has been conditioned to respond in a certain way. And mm -hmm. if I mean, I always go back to chat GPT and say, well, do you really mean that? And it kind of is open. So, well, not really. But I mean, so so but the the the, the, the kind of responses that, that seem to they seem to be getting was feeding into their videos was, well, AI lacks the empathy. It doesn't have the empathy of human beings. Um, now, I'm not sure that empathy actually in a design necessarily makes a better design. I'm not sure about that at all. But what I would say is that that discussion you had in your video, and I really would recommend everybody to have a look at that discussion. It was absolutely fabulous. They were much more polite than any human being would be. <laughs> it was astonishing, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because it's, you know, it's a customizable intelligence, right? So, you know, whatever chat GPT generally is, um, you know, if you needed a situation that, that if you had a situation where you needed the empathy dialed up to 11, um, you could do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you had some sort of alien intelligence designing buildings in, 
Bangladesh. And shout out to Bangladesh, by the way. I, I went to a conference there about seven years ago, one of the best weeks of my life. Um, if you had, um, you know, an alien intelligence designing something, you know, you could pre-program that with like, you know, let's keep the colonial influences for, to a minimum and like not cover Bangladesh with, you know, international style architecture and this sort of thing, like whatever you do has to, uh, you know, honor the traditional building practices and materiality and form making like present in Bangladeshi architecture. And, um, you know, I mean, these models currently are overly programmed with Western influences, which is predictable because like they, they were created in the West. Um, but I'm optimistic that, that AI is, is capable of overcoming that problem and learning new tricks. So. No, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think the, one of the big issues people talk about AI is, is the bias, you know, yeah. and the bias, of course, comes from us. I mean, it's from the data that we're producing and it's being replicated in AI, AI. And you could recalibrate any machine learning system, as you say, to get rid of that. But humans will always have that bias. So I, I, I completely agree with that. With, yeah, um, it's, it's not algorithmic bias. It's, it's our bias. And, you know, that's another myth. I mean, we... we sometimes look in the mirror and we don't like what we see coming back at us. So we, we blame the technology. Yeah. I mean, just go look at Google. If you go to Google and say, you know, and, 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 and Google nurse, you will get women, female figures. In, and, and that's the, <laughs> you know, it's so absolutely. It's all that's there, but just, I want to just pick up on this a bit, a bit more because you kind of, hinted that you thought in in your in your article in your in your videos well you, you thought that there was uh that be the chat gpt being programmed to be a bit soft on certain questions i mean i've noticed that with you know is ai going to affect employment and it says no not at all you know it's going to be assistant and so on do, do you think it's been it's being conditioned or framed or programmed in a certain way i mean we get with for example with with mid journey, there's a aesthetic that comes out that yeah. isn't just in the data. It's something that's been framed in a way. What do you think? I mean, I think the most alarming thing is that we we no one may know the answer to that question. You know, I mean, if you take um, you know Altman and Brockman and uh, the rest of them at their word, like they don't actually know what's going on. inside the black box, right? They don't know how these these LLMs are actually working and, and putting this stuff together. If that's the case, you know, what level of control do they have over how how the model is is worked? You know, is, is there a switch that they can flip and say, okay, you know, make ChatGPT mean now or make it nicer? Um, I assume they have some level of control, but um, they probably don't have as much control as we would like them to have. Um, And I think you know that's that's terrifying as well as exciting is is that we're we're dealing with something that is growing um, and that is learning to some degree like on its own um, and we are going to have to nurture that intelligence so it doesn't kill us um, because you know if if we don't do it the right way we we may encounter a problem um, I mean clearly there are there's some things going on with Chat GPT so. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've caught these articles, but like, you know, the latest thing seems to be like, if you ask ChatGPT like really nicely or you sound desperate, like it gets more cooperative. You know, if you write in a prompt that says like, hey, I need to write a report for my boss and I'm going to get fired, da, 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 like, can you help me write this thing? Like it does a better job than it would if you just like asked it to do something. Um, Or, you know, it gets lazier towards like the end of the year. That was a story that came out in December because it's imitating us and, and because, you know, people do, um, you know, less work gets done in, in December. I mean, it's kind of global phenomenon. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, there's there's two terrifying possibilities. One, that a small number of people at a private corporation have uh, entire control over how responsive gpt is and in what way and the other terrifying possibility is that no one has any control so i you know strap in um it's going to be an interesting time eric this has been great i just i want to ask just those in the zoom conversation if they've got any questions they want to ask at this stage um i don't michael do you want to ask one Yeah, Neil. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, hi, Eric. This was a great talk and actually great discussion. Really, really enjoyed it. Can you all hear me well? This is a new microphone. Yes. <laughs> anyway, 
Okay, wonderful. Um, um, well, yeah, just picking up on the on the last remark uh, you made, Eric. Yeah, I um I was just watching before this. I was watching a uh, um a lecture from uh, Jeffrey Hinton at MIT, a recent lecture. And um, uh, Hinton, I think, as much as people like uh, you know Joshua Bach, or, or takes, I think, takes the position that ultimately, um, humanity is kind of transitional, whatever that really means. But I think Hinton would take the point that yeah, we might have to come to terms with the fact that, um, we are we are going to well, I guess replacement is not the right word, but. Uh, uh, there is an evolution and there may be beings in the future that are smarter than us and maybe humanity as we know it today is not going to be around forever in a certain way and i was thinking i was thinking um uh, of, of apocalypse and disaster and maybe time scales and what qualifies as disaster i mm -hmm. suppose within within a kind of time frame like would that be would that is that do we think of that as a kind of as a kind of disaster or as a kind of apocalypse, the thought that uh, we, as we know ourselves today, um, uh, you know, may uh, uh, may not exist in some kind of future. Well, I guess we know that for some distant future, right? But maybe yeah. this is the point is gonna would be uh, could be closer than we are actually uh, thinking. And I was actually wondering if that uh, if you know if we think of design practices that are that we would you know we might think of as like more than human or like designing with and for other forms of being and other forms of intelligence. If that in, in a sense con contains in itself a sense that humanity um, at least is, is sort of, uh, is sort of changing. And if that is, um, I don't know if that one could see, could think of as uh also relating to a kind of, uh, I wouldn't say disaster, but a kind of a, a um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. I'll leave that open. Just to, curious to yeah. hear your thoughts on I, this. I, I think I hear what you're saying, um, <clears throat> and I think um, the the words that Elon Musk had used to describe that phenomenon was describing humanity as a bootloader for an artificial intelligence, right? Like we were the mm. thing that came that that then loaded up the thing that that lasts to eternity um and whether or not it's a disaster i think is is a philosophical and perhaps a spiritual issue i mean i think it has special relevance right. for architects right. because i i gotta assume that that part of the joy of being an architect is making something bigger and more permanent than yourself right you you know if you're really invested in your design you're taking something out of yourself and you're putting it into the world in the form of steel and concrete and you know it's going to be there hopefully after you're gone um and you know it will stand as this sort of you know memory of of you um and that's intrinsic i think to the process of creation like we all seek to create things that might outlast us so in the case of, you know, AI and, and humanity, you know, I've had this conversation with myself and say, you know, look, if it were ultimately the fate of the human race that we, you know, essentially gave birth to this, this alternate intelligence um, that then, you know, fanned out like across the cosmos and did all these wonderful things, would that be bad? Like, would that be a history that we would be ashamed of as human beings or dissatisfied with? somehow. Um, and I wonder, you know, what, how it relates to the process of parenthood. I don't have any children, so I'm speculating and hopefully no parents in the audience get mad at me for doing so. But, um, you know, when you have a child and you, you raise up that child, if that child goes on to do things that transcend you, um, you're not mad, like, you're not like pissed at the kid because you are part of its success. And, you know, you can look at the ways in which that, that child has transcended you and gone beyond you and be proud because that has a lot to do with what what you did as a parent, you know, like that's that's your creation that's transcending you and, and in most cases outlasting you. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, is there is there generally speaking a future for humanity? Yes, I think so. Um but I think even in the event that that there wasn't and that 
the ultimate story of planet Earth is that there were a bunch of dinosaurs, they died, and then there were a bunch of animals, and one of the animals got really smart and invented a machine intelligence. And, you know, then that became the thing that lasted forever. I still think that'd be a pretty good story, you know? I mean, assuming we create the right kind of successor to whatever our time has been. So nice. I appreciate the question. I appreciate ending on some, you know, really super totally. philosophical. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Points. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. we could go on, I guess, for another two hours on this question, but it's, uh, it's super interesting and yeah, yeah wonderful. Um, uh, thanks for this. This is, uh, I, I'm guessing we've already gone for two hours and something. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> Neil. Yeah, we have, I, I don't know if Smara wants to ask questions. One final one from Smara. Mm, yeah, I would just like to ask uh, whether you think this type of, uh, let's say, somewhat negative speculation about the future taps a little bit into the unconscious mind and it makes us feel as humans that there's something to worry about, to care about for the future. Or like it has a psychological effect to it because I think people are very much drawn to this type of disaster thinking. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's all over the news. It's a little bit of a um, of a different realm, I think, of uh, of thinking and speculating about it. Um, I I think I understand the phenomena you're um, speculating on, but um, can I be clear about the question? Are you asking me whether that that is that negative speculation mm -hmm. is a good thing or like where it comes from? Yeah, I mean, because so far it feels like uh, it has all been like in with negative with negative connotations the the whole talk, and I'm just asking whether it has for you as a as a writer as an architect is it something that you do consciously or is it just um, how you you see things or do you feel like people are more drawn to these types of speculation? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's not a marketing gimmick. Um, it's it's not. As far as I know, you know, some latent psychological trait. Um, and I don't consider my message negative. Um, you know, for me, disaster is fundamentally a positive thing because there are a lot of things that don't happen, frankly, until we have a disaster. So, you know, we needed the fire of Lisbon in order to have the enlightenment, like we needed the city fires in order to develop building codes. We, you know, we, human beings are funny that way, right? I mean, Churchill said something about, you know, Americans can always be trusted to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other option. Um, and I kind of feel the way about people generally in response to disaster, you know? I mean, they'll just they'll watch that dam and they'll see crack and crack and leak and leak and leak and not do anything until like the dam collapses but then they'll get their ass in gear and actually do things. So, you know, in my work and in my teaching and my lecturing and, and you know, the things that I'm doing related to AI, it's, it's not morbid in my opinion. Like it's not intended to be, you know, hey, let's get together and commiserate about like the awful future. Um, it's a proposition that if we can acknowledge that something really bad could happen and we could agree on that, then that's the first step to us getting together and making something really good happen, right? That's the moment where we can all get together and say, hey, the dam's about to collapse. Let's evacuate people. Let's design a new dam. Let's, let's do all these things. Um, and indeed, that's the way that it's always been with human beings, right? Things have to get really bad before we do really good things. And I think this AI business specifically as applied to architecture you know, my hope is that more architects can look at it and say, holy shit, like this thing is coming from my job. And, you know, half of all architects are going to be unemployed in five years. What should we do instead? Right. And, you know, don't leave and like go sell real estate. Well, I mean, sell real estate if that's your passion or something like that. But let's initiate a collective conversation about what architecture is going to become. Um, and, you know, how are we, what are we going to design next? You know, now that, machines have taken over all the construction documents like what what can we do um and i think there's just there's enormous possibilities you know climate change is bearing down on all of us and it needs solutions and some of those solutions are the sort of solutions that you know architects should be at the head of the table if not at least in the room or something like that you know we need to be engaged with those sorts of things and smaro my my worry is that with the 
I keep calling them Pollyannish, um, you know, maybe that's a little bit too harsh, but with the really, you know, positive messages, people go back to sleep, right? And they say, okay, you know, so-and-so at the AIA or at Reba said, you know, AI is not an issue. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, those are the people that are going to hurt, hurt most because we tend to prepare for the disasters that we see coming. Um, and we tend to be unprepared for the disasters that we don't. And if you prepare for a disaster that's coming, then most of the time it doesn't actually become a disaster, right? So like you, you solve the problem ahead of time. So the disaster just never materializes. So um, yeah, that's also a kind of rambling answer, but I think your, your question is an important one. Um, I don't see my work as negative, you know? I mean, I think we have to be brutally honest about the wolf at the door before we start doing the really positive things. And I think that's why I... I have the message that I do. That was a fabulous answer, Eric, and a fabulous answer to end on. I, I always think that the, from my background in critical theory, the point about critical theory and, and problematizing things was actually, the idea was to improve something. You pinpoint a problem and then you'd improve it. But also critical mm -hmm. theory was a technique that certainly I tried to employ to bring into the architectural domain that was otherwise a kind of self-legitimizing kind of discourse, some critical tools that were absent. Now, I thought we, what we did, to, or what we saw today was a really fabulous demonstration of bringing um, some critical tools into the, the debate about architecture, tools that we were otherwise previously unaware of. And I thought they were very, very powerful to kind of burst that bubble and, and expose some of these issues. And I think this was really an astonishing presentation. I think, you know, cutting Thanks. through all the myths that we have in architecture one by one. I think there are a few more out there, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's part two. <laughs> well, we need to have a part two at some point. I think, Eric, this is really, I think it was one of the most productive things because it was completely unexpected. And I think this is exactly what we need. You know, someone coming from a different angle uh, and asking tough questions uh, 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 because without that, we are going to be and I have to, when you mentioned about her sleep, I have to say that one of the, the comments that ChatGPT threw back at me was the thing that otherwise we will be sleepwalking into oblivion. And that struck mm. me as precisely the warning that you were giving. We need to wake yeah. up to this. Otherwise, we will be sleepwalking into oblivion as a profession. But I also agree with a potential optimism. No, there are ways in which we can adapt, absorb these tools, um, but we need to engage them now uh, to prevent the disaster rather than once the disasters happened. And I think this is the very, very clear message, Eric. This was absolutely fabulous. And I think everybody, every single architect, every single student of architecture, especially because you pinpointed something I never read us before, that actually it's those who are younger, who are more at risk, need yeah. to listen to this. Everybody yeah. needs to listen to this talk. It was absolutely amazing. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Um, Thanks for having me, y'all. Uh, um, this has been great. And... Um... Hope we continue the discussion. Yes, and I just want to thank also the Digital Futures team, especially Michal and so on, for putting it, the, it's like an iceberg. There are a lot of people working on this behind the scenes. And just to mention briefly that uh, um, Michal and I are working on another series um, that's going to start on the 18th of February on architecture and philosophy um, as part of the doctoral consortium. And we're now kicking off the, the rest of the years, well, the, the year's um, presentations um, about uh, 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 for the digital futures itself, and including it's going to be a series on AI plus, which talk about AI being applied to different domains and so on. But this was so so helpful, Eric. I I, um, I want you to write a book on this. This is really very useful, <laughs> I mean, incredibly useful. Um, um, uh, I'm going to take a look away a lot for it. So thank you so much. Thank you to our audience and thank you for those questions. Um, uh, uh, amazing, truly amazing. Thanks so much, Eric. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. This is great. Great. Okay. See you soon. Bye.